Um, so glad to be here today. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the, the some of the dignitaries I know in the crowd, but Mayor Cornette, it's wonderful to see you here, and, and former Mayor uh, Humphreys. Uh, and I know this is not just an Oklahoma City event, uh, but that so many of you come from so many different places, and that has me excited. I have to say I'm, I'm a bit nervous today, not for the reasons you might think, but I'm on Twitter, and last night one of you tweeted, I can't sleep tonight, so excited that I get to see Jeff Speck tomorrow. <laughs> and to which I was going to respond, I can't sleep tonight, I have a stalker. <laughs> um, but the real reason I couldn't sleep last night is that a copy of, of a copy of President Boren's book, A Letter to America, was left by my bed, and it got me so worked up that I was, uh, I was not in a position to sleep easily. So um, this is one, especially if you include the crowd downstairs, this is probably the largest group I've ever addressed. This is an amazing collection of people around this idea, and I have to say, uh, to, give, to give our side credit, this is the best, and I'm not, you don't know me, so you don't know that I'm, I'm not full of it. I'm not giving you a line when I say this is the best collection of thought leaders on this topic that has ever come together, to my knowledge, in this country. Um, I'm, I'm going to miss a few, but I mean, you have the best person, Dick Jackson, connecting health to the design of place. You have the, the, the best known person, studying fixing our suburbs, Ellen Dunham Jones. Um, you have uh, um, the best person discussing urban economics and real estate in Chris Leinberger. Uh, the list goes on, I won't name you all, but everyone, everyone who's here, Don, Don Ripkema is the leading historical preservation economist in the country. And these are all people who when I was at the National Institute, when I was, when I was at, the, um, at the NEA and trying to staff the Mayor's Institute on City Design and looking for the best people in the country. These are the people that I got to know. Uh, and it's just wonderful that, that they're, all, they're all here today. Um, so I was talking with Blair, and thank you, Blair, for Blair Humphreys for putting this together, um, about there were two ways I could take this talk, and there's two parts of my book. The first part is why walkability is so important. And that's its own lecture, and it could be a three-hour lecture. Uh, and that's the lecture I've been giving a lot more in communities lately because a lot of communities need to be convinced about this. Then there's the other part of the book, which is the big part, which is how to achieve it. And I was asking, um, oh, I forgot to mention my own credentials. I'm the best in the country at stealing from all these other people who I, <laughs> who I mentioned. Um, I was asking, and the first part of my book, the why, is actually stolen from other people. A chapter is basically stolen from Dr. Jackson, a, sto a chapter is stolen from Chris Leinberger, and a chapter is stolen from, from some other groups we could, we could talk about, the folks we could talk about. But I asked Blair, you know, should I do the, should I do the why walkability talk, knowing that people here were, if they were showing up at this event, they were probably a little bit on board, but also that they would be hearing from Chris Leinberger and from Dr. Jackson. And, and he said something, I hope this doesn't get me in trouble, he said, you know, it's very easy to, to talk about why this is important and to say you support walkability. But whether you achieve it or not is in the details. It's in the built outcomes. And so we need to move on very quickly beyond just explaining why to explaining how. And I have to say that will be the major focus of, of my talk. But the, um, a little bit of background on me. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a city planner. That means I work on plans for two types of places, for existing places like South Beach in Miami, where I lived for a decade, uh, or for new places like Kentlands in Washington, outside of Washington, D.C., a new suburb. But I'm also a new urbanist, a card, proud card-carrying member of the Congress for New Urbanism, which means we actually look at these older places in order to and, you know, measure the trees, measure the streets, count the trees, count the cars, see how they work in order to design the new places that we make, because we feel that, it, that the best places to live in America tend to be still these places that were built uh, pre-war. And before I leave this slide, I always make a point of saying, I remind this slide reminds me of my decade in Miami, um, half of what you're going to hear today and, and the majority of what I know, uh, I learned from my time in Miami working with Andre Stuani and Elizabeth Plater Zyberg, who were the real founders of the, of the new urbanist uh, movement. And I want to make sure they're, they're credited today. 
But of course, we don't study Miami to make Cantlands. We study Georgetown to make Cantlands. And each place needs to grow out of its region. But I did that work for quite a long time. And with Andres and Liz wrote this book based on the, the story, really, that I first heard from Andres in 1988 um, about the distinctions between towns, villages, cities on the one hand, and suburban sprawl on the other. And that book, fortunately, was read by the head of the National Endowment for the Arts, so I got appointed to run design at the NEA for four years, where I oversaw this program, uh, the Mayor's Institute on City Design. And if there was anything I learned more from than working at DPZ, it was probably uh, this workshop where every two months, somewhere in America, we would collect up eight mayors, eight designers. We'd lock ourselves in a room for three days. Each mayor would bring their most pressing urban design challenge. And we tried to solve those challenges. Uh, I found more and more of these challenges relating to something that I had never, never discussed before directly, yet all my work had been focused on indirectly, which was making places that had, that had street life. Places that were alive, and alive was defined by having street life, and street life was defined as being walkable. And so slowly I've kind of reoriented my discussion around this term, which I find people find much more palatable than, well, first it was neo-traditional town planning. That really rolls off the tongue and, and offends the, liber the liberals. And then you have uh, what it became, which was new urbanism, which of course offended the conservatives. So uh, walkability, it's the same stuff. It's good urbanism. It's making places where people want to be um, but it's looking at walking as the best measure of their success. I've done a lot of work lately for this group, CEOs for Cities, and they're brought into cities by institutions, universities, government, big businesses, or just the wealthy people, the town fathers and mothers, who say to them, uh, we want our kids to stay here. You know, we want our grandkids to stay here. What can we do? Um, and CEOs for Cities understands that half of that work is programming, management, you know, what Ethan, what Ethan Kent was talking about um, earlier today, um, and um, having events like Art Prize in Grand Rapids, or how big the convention center needs to be, or the state, whether you have a stadium or not. And that's all important, but they understand that the other half is design, just the everyday design of streets and spaces and the details that either generate street life or thwart it. So, if we believe in this room, as I think we all do, that pedestrians make place, um, that leads me to asking the question, why do we need to be walkable? If we want to make places, then walkability has to be central to that. But actually, there's three other reasons, covered to a certain degree today by other speakers, why we need to be walkable as a nation to continue to thrive as a nation. Um, and the amazing experience being a planner and someone who was trained in design and as an architect to be looking at places and what we do, to be looking at what we do through this window of design and knowing, for example, that I hated suburbia and sprawl and I loved villages and towns and cities and saying, well, it was an aesthetic, it, it was an aesthetic approach that I was taking, that we all took as designers, that, oh, suburbia is ugly or really the full definition of aesthetic, right? We just, in all, all of our senses, suburbia insults our senses and urban and natural environments reward our senses. But people don't really listen to aesthetic arguments and they frankly don't listen to planners because the planners blew it for so many years, right? Um, and then the sociologists started talking about it. So Robert Putnam in two, 1999 maybe comes out with the book Bowling Alone and documents how every 10 minutes you add to your commute, you're 10 minutes less likely to belong to a church or, or participate in government, or you know, do things in your community. But you know, sociologists, people don't really listen to them either so much. But an amazing thing happened starting about 15 years ago. Three groups of people who people listen to, using their own terms and numbers, statistics, started saying, well, actually, the suburbs are killing us, and cities can save us. First, there were the economists, like Chris Leinberger, who were documenting not only how um, cities are more efficient, but they're actually more productive. And that's where people want to be, as Chris described this morning. Growing numbers of people have, every, have more reason to want to be in cities. Secondly, there were the epidemiologists like Dr. Jackson, who said, cities are, uh, said suburb, the suburbs are killing us, and cities hold the key to the 
to our future health. And then finally, there's the environmentalists who, you know, 30 years ago, no one listened to. But after Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring and we put more laws on the books supporting uh, our environment than any other type subsequent to that, new laws in, in, in Washington, uh, now the environmentalists have a seat at the table and people listen to them. And they, they've, they've turned on a dime in a way that I'll describe. So the three arguments I'll talk about very briefly because I want to get into the how as quickly as possible. But Chris Leinberger talked about one side of the discussion, which is all the demand and why, why there's this pent-up demand that's ready to be satisfied for urban living in our, in our country and how we're not currently satisfying it and how, for example, only 35% of the people in Atlanta who want to live in a walkable neighborhood can either find or, can find or afford a walkable neighborhood. You know, Two-thirds can't find or afford a home in, the, in a walkable neighborhood that want to live in walkable neighborhoods. But there's the other side of it, which, which Mr. Leimberger hinted at, which is the tremendous cost to our society of all the driving we're doing. This drive to your quali to you quali till you qualify phenomenon. Um, but also, he mentioned that, that among people who live in the suburbs, they're paying 25% of their income on driving. Actually, among the people that are defined as, the work as working Americans, um, which is lower income, working Americans, really, uh, they're paying more now for transportation than for housing. It's made, that, it's made that flip. But then the question you can ask is, what happens if you invest in walkability? And the great example there, and it's in, it's in, it's in the, my book, and you've all talked, I'm sure, a little bit about Portland, Oregon, is that Portland started making a number of key decisions in the 70s that fundamentally changed the way that people live in Portland. You know, while most other cities were growing this unending spare tire of sprawl, Portland put in an urban growth boundary. While most other cities were adding highways, Portland added bicycle facilities and transit. While most other cities were reaming out their streets and removing parallel parking and adding lanes and narrowing sidewalks, Port Portland instituted a skinny streets program. And these changes and others like them over just a few decades fundamentally changed the way that Portlanders live. So that by 1996, their vehicle miles travels, traveled peaked and they've been declining ever since. And Portlanders now drive 20% less than your typical American, which the economist Joe Courtright calculates out to, if you take the cost of the driving itself, about four miles extra a day, or the time that you spend, the 11 minutes extra a day that they would be spending, that's about 3.5% of their GDP. Then you ask, well, what are they spending that on? And Portland is reputed to have the most roof racks per capita, the most independent bookstores per capita, the most strip clubs per capita. <laughs> These are all slight exaggerations of the fact that they do consume recreation more than the rest of America, second highest number of restaurants per capita in the country, but most of it's going into housing. And housing is the most local investment you can make, whereas 85% of what you spend on cars leaves the local economy. You know, what you spend on housing is about as local as, as you can get. So, and then there's the other factor, which Mr. Leinberger alluded to, which is it also so happens, not coincidentally, that educated young people are moving to Portland in droves. So the population of college-educated 25 to 35-year-olds in the 90s went up 50% in Portland, way above the national average. Because it's just a place that people want to be because it offers that quality of life that Chris talked about. Dick Jackson will be talking to us this afternoon about the relationship between health and community design, or health and walkability. And most of what I've learned about this, I've learned from him and from his book. I, I, and I say this in all my lectures around the country, that the best day to be a planner in America was August 9th, 2004, when his book, uh, Urban Sprawl and Public Health, came out. And said in no uncertain terms, the suburbs are killing us, and cities can save us, and here's why. And the, the overwhelming statistics that you all know about the obesity ep epidemic and therefore the diabetes and other related illness epidemic that we have in the US. And the fact that fully one third of all kids born after 2000 will become diabetics, according to the doctors today. And just statistic after statistic, but what Dr. Jackson and his colleagues found out, and there have been more studies since, is that yes, it relates to diet. And we can talk all day and should talk all day about the American corn syrup-based diet and what that's done to our vitality as a nation. 
but it seems to relate and correlate even more closely to inactivity. There have been some wonderful studies like one in England called gluttony versus sloth that was very informative. Um, and another, um, any number of them that not only document, you know, this, this James Levine at the Mayo Clinic put people in electronic underwear and saw how much they were moving and, 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 and found, that, found that it was principally, it wasn't a DNA factor, a genetic factor, it was principally people's level of motion during the day that was determined, that was determining whether they were gaining weight or not. But now we have even more detailed studies that relate it specifically to place that show that if you live in what's rated as a high walkable neighborhood of San Diego, you're 35% likely to be overweight. But if you live in a low walkable neighborhood, you're 65% likely to be overweight. And these are, these are you know, academic, careful studies that zero out age and income and the other things that correlate with, with body mass. So it's clear that, this is, that there's a place-based solution. And I like to say that you know, the American healthcare crisis is really a, an urban design crisis with walkability at the heart of the cure. Getting beyond the fact that for decades and decades we've simply designed places that have engineered out of our lives the, the useful walk. And then finally there's the environmentalists. And the, the tradition of environmentalism in America for so many years has been anti-city. And that was certainly, certainly became even more so when we began carbon mapping and the typical carbon map, for example, of Chicago, what you see on the left here, um, looks like the night sky photographs of the nation where they're measuring carbon per square mile. And, um, you know, cities are bright red, countryside is blue, the suburbs are kind of in between. But what Scott Bernstein at the Center for Neighborhood Technology did in 2001 was to ask, is that the right way to measure it? So actually, we should be measuring per mile, we should be, should be measuring per person. You know, it's not how much we pollute, it's not how much our area pollutes, it's how much our area causes us to pollute. And when you do that, all of the maps of all the American cities just flip. And that's why in his book, Green Metropolis, an amazing book written by David Owen, a New Yorker writer, I really recommend it. Um, he, makes it he makes it plain that, you know, Manhattan is the most sustainable place to live in America. They consume one third the gasoline of the rest of us. Um, of course, if you go to Toronto, they consume half as much. If you go to Europe, they consume half as much as Toronto does. If you go to Hong Kong, they consume half as much as Europe does. I, I like to joke that 10 Hong Kongers who moved to New York, if they wanted to keep their gas consumption the same, nine of them would have to stay home. But the, the fact is that we seem to have a long way to go, but the places, interestingly, the places that pollute the least are also the places that seem to score the highest on the Mercer Index of the quality of life of communities. There's an amazing correlation between sustainability of communities and quality of life. And so, oh, does being sustainable make our life better? No. The thing that makes us sustainable is what our makes, makes our life better. And that thing is living in a walkable community. And, you know, the, the environmental, you know, it, the, the way I like to put it is, you know, if we pollute so much in America because we're throwing away our time, our money, our lives on the highway, then maybe those two problems share the same solution, which is to make our communities more walkable. It's been done other places. It's starting to happen here. Um, certainly starting to happen in Oklahoma City, which is great to see. And now I'm gonna now I'm gonna start my talk. So. I told Blair, I was, I'll, I'll cut some slides. He said, no, no, it's OK. We'll see how he feels. So if pedestrians make place, then how do you get people to walk? So this is my general theory of walkability. It's a work in progress, but it's the best I've got. I'm happy to share it with you. Uh, this is the book that will give you all the details. You don't need to take notes, because it's all in here. Uh, and I know you're gonna pick, all going to pick one up. Uh, how do you get people to walk? You have to have a reason to walk. Now, now in most of America, most of America, in the places that concern me, you know, not the New Yorks, not the Boston's, not the San Francisco's. That's the anomaly. We're in places where most Americans live, most people have cars. And the question isn't how we can get all these volunteer pedestrians to throw their cars away, but to create pedestrians among people who own the car and who are used to driving it. And if you're going to create pedestrians in the typical American city where driving is still cheap and easy, then you need to get a lot done right. And you need to get four things done right. There needs to be a reason to walk, which means the proper balance of uses. There needs to be a safe walk, which means being safe and feeling safe. The walk needs to be comfortable, and the walk needs to be interesting. 
So let's go through those one by one. The reason to, to walk discussion has to do with the failure of the planning profession uh, in more recent years and the formative victory of the planning profession where the planners, not yet called planners, moved the houses away from the dark satanic mills and life, lifespans increased dramatically immediately and as Andres Duani likes to say, the planners were hailed as heroes and have been trying to repeat that experience ever since with Euclidean zoning and this vast separation of uses into large single-use zones. Um, you know, look at Manhattan. It's like a Rothko versus a, uh, I guess, a Syrah, right? We see the pointillist Syrah. Um, but what's interesting about this ma map of Manhattan, half of those zones are mixed use to begin with. So imagine, uh, you know, the drivable versus the walkable community. Uh, but it fundamentally has to do with the classic, forgive me for sharing it, but it's so important, the classic new urbanist discussion, which is that there are only two ways, two tested ways to make community in the world throughout history and across cultures. One is the traditional neighborhood, compact, diverse, walkable, and the other is suburban sprawl, spread out, not walkable, single-use areas. Now, the traditional neighborhood evolved naturally in response to man's needs, uh, the neighborhood was invented, uh, sorry, the, the, sorry, the neighborhood evolved tr in response to man's needs. Suburban sprawl was invented after World War II, um, and it's so easy and fun to kind of classify it. It has so few parts, um, you know, the places where you only live, the places where you only work, the places where you only shop, uh, the supersized public institutions, including the ball fields. You know, this is why we have the soccer mom, because no kid would ever be allowed along that arterial to get to these eight baseball diamonds, eight soccer fields. Um, that's, it's funny, but it's not a joke. That's, that's why we have the soccer mom. And then if you separate everything from everything else and reconnect it only with automotive infrastructure, then you need to have all of these highways. And the great kind of fundamental miscalculation when Frank Lloyd Wright designed Broadacre City and we were, we were thinking of what these suburbs would be is that no one really counted the cars and, and how our national interstate highway, highways which were created for commerce and for vacation travel would become commuter ways for so many of us. Um, so I always tell people, you know, it's a two-part deal. You can have this, this is the American thing you can have, but just understand that it comes with this in equal measure, uh, often to absurd extremes. And uh, then there's the experience of being in these places. This is a... a this is Walter Kulash's slide. There's a reason for this, but it would take the rest of my allotted time to explain to you why this is there. Um, the experience of being a driver, and, and then more recently, uh, being a pedestrian in these environments. And then uh, Dick Jackson and his colleagues favor this slide, which I'm trying to find out who took this picture because I want, I want to be able to use this picture. No one knows who took it, some mythological some, some ghost took this picture, but the idea that you drive to the parking lot, to the escalator, to the fitness club to get on the treadmill and walk miles that you would normally walk in your own neighborhood, and, and, and um, you know, it's, it's sad. So when you look then at an existing uh, neighborhood center, place where walkability is possible, the useful walk is possible, because you have the beginning of that mix of uses, you ask the question then, which uses are missing or underrepresented? And in most downtowns, and even in those that are, that are coming back, including, you know, like Oklahoma City, it is housing that is drastically underrepresented. And then once the housing comes, you know, last, I, I was in Oklahoma City, not the last time, but the time before, the taxi driver who was taking me out of downtown said, there is no shopping in downtown Oklahoma City. Now that's an exaggeration, but that's just perception. But the truth is that it isn't until you have the housing that these other things will start to come. The supermarket will come. And there's, there's clear thresholds that, you know, they need you to cross, and then the stuff starts to come in. And since I was last in Oklahoma City, well, since I did my first work in Oklahoma City, where the housing was arriving, now there's a couple more great coffee shops that weren't there before, and you're seeing now these great amenities arriving because of the housing that's arrived in the downtown. And then on the other side of it, what's underpriced? What's overrepresented? And in most cases, it is parking. And this is a whole discussion I'm not going to get into with you today. But uh, the parking meter invented in Oklahoma City. Uh, this is Don Shoup, the father of modern parking, who wrote the great book, The High Cost of Free Parking, that explains it all so, so clearly. But you know, this is a wonderful book. Uh, it's a wonderful um, quote in his book from American Planning Magazine in the 30s or whenever it was when that first parking meter was invented. And it said, 
You know, when, one, when businesses on one side of the street get them, businesses on the other side of the street demand them. When one town center gets the parking meter, the next town center demands it. Because what we've forgotten, what merchants who often fight for, for you know, what the merchants who fight putting a price on parking or put the, putting the right price on parking don't remember is that it's the empty space in front of the store that allows Daddy Warbucks to pull up in front of the furrier you know, and make that transaction. And so pricing your parking right is essential to the success of downtown urban centers. There's a lot more to talk about. Transit's a big part of this discussion, but again, time is limited. The safe walk has to do with the 100 mo moving parts that make up the, the public urban realm and uh, how most cities get about 50 of those wrong. Block size. Block size is key to the walkability of communities. This is Portland, Oregon, famously walkable, famous 200-foot blocks. Salt Lake City, famously unwalkable, 600-foot uh, blocks. It's almost like two different organisms, you know, a chipmunk and a dinosaur. And you know, the thing is that when you have a 200-foot block, you can have a city of mostly two-lane streets. And most streets in Portland are two lanes. And in, in Salt Lake, they're you know, mostly six lanes. And of course, more lanes means, uh, means more danger. This is a study from 24 different California cities. As you double block size, you triple the number of fatal crashes, mostly because of the, of the width of the streets. So how about that number of lanes? You know, what can we do to make that a little more reasonable? And this is a conversation that it pertains both to highways, but also to local streets. And it's the discussion of induced demand. And I would never, ever give a talk to a group this large and fail to talk to you about induced demand, because it's the great black hole in the world of planning. Um, this is a chart we've been showing for 30 years now. I got it from Rick Chelman. I bet he got it from someone else. But the, the way that traffic planning occurs in America, where you anticipate, you forecast increased numbers of drivers, and so you widen streets. And what isn't taken into that calculation is the induced traffic and the fact that people change their habits when you provide them with e an easier path. And there's, there's, I could talk for an hour, I would love to talk for hours about all the reasons that this happens. But driving is what economists call a free good. You don't pay the real cost as a driver. In fact, if you own a car, four-fifths of the cost of owning a car are fixed costs that you're going to pay whether you drive or not. And only one-fifth are variable costs. And so the smart choice, if you have a car, is to drive it all the time. You know, the more miles you drive, each, the cheaper each mile is. Um, and then in congested systems, the only constraint to driving typically is the congestion, not the cost. So obviously, when you get rid of the one constraint, you invite more drivers. And it's a longer story, but you understand. And you know, this is common knowledge, right? Newsweek magazine, I ripped this out with glee. Demand from drivers tends to overwhelm the new supply. Today's engineers acknowledge that building new roads usually make tra makes traffic worse. To which I, I respond, where are these engineers and may I please meet them? <laughs> because city to city, the, the municipal engineers who I work with will tell you they understand it superficially, but then they will make decisions on a daily basis that show that they don't really understand it. I have to say Oklahoma City is one of the cities that's making real progress in this regard, but it's a challenge wherever I go, where the traffic engineers say, you need, you need those extra lanes because the traffic is coming, you put them in, the traffic comes, and they say, see, I told you so, you needed those lanes. But interestingly, it works both ways. So in, when the Embarcadero Freeway had to come down in San Francisco, or the Central Freeway, or when the West Side Highway in New York City had to come down, and everyone predicted a Carmageddon, there was no Carmageddon, there were no traffic jams, the parallel streets did not did not suffer um, because people adjusted their behavior. Now, I should add that these investments or disinvestments in highways were made hand in hand with investments in transit, like this little trolley in San Francisco that with its buddies carries more people per day than the Embarcadero Expressway ever carried, um, and also investments in public open spaces and making streets that people want to walk in. Um, and then, interesting, they took great pictures when I was here in Oklahoma City. But there are some, some cities I've worked in where it's actually not, it's not about induced demand because the demand isn't there. And one of the most eye-opening experiences I had was coming to Oklahoma, the invitation of Mayor Cornette.
He had been to the Mayor's Institute, and he was already a design buff, but I think that sealed the deal. And um, he was working towards Oklahoma City being a healthier city, and then Prevention Magazine comes out with this article that says Oklahoma City is the worst city for pedestrians in the entire country, which couldn't possibly be true, but it made for good copy, and Mick's like, help! So I came to, came to Oklahoma City and did a walkability study. Now look at your blocks. They're a little bigger than Portland's blocks, but they're not that much bigger. I think they're about 350, maybe, um, which is pretty normal. But look at your streets. You have Salt Lake City, you have almost Portland blocks, and you have Salt Lake City streets. So we looked at the car counts. And uh, before I leave this slide, I will note that Gaylord, at least at this time, was 9668 to 9,000 to 12,000 car counts. And these are the car counts on these streets. Almost none of them over 10,000, most of them 3,000, 2,000. And we know that two lanes can easily handle 10,000 cars per day. These were the streets that in the city's current plan, just approved, were designated to be rebuilt as four laners, five laners, six laners. And they were handling two lanes of traffic. So, you know, there's Hudson, 8,000 cars per day, six lanes of traffic. So, Fortunately, this study was done at the same time that Devon Tower was being built, and $160 million in tax increment financing was being raised, and, and the mayor and, and city manager Jim Couch and Larry Nichols of Devon Energy said, let's reinvest this in the heart of our downtown and rebuild 50 blocks of our city from building face to building face and do it right. So Project 180, which is now underway, as you know, is transforming a principally uh, four to six lane and half one-way system to an all two-way, principally two to four lane system. And you know, these are the drawings that I made walking around with the Jim Burnett team, just designing each street. And now you know, we see more professionally, by the real professionals, um, how streets are being transformed, drawn, built. And then this, this really nice before and after comparison by the coal cord. Um, in some cases, reducing supply. Uh, in other cases, well, I should say, in all cases, making the right amount of supply uh, or a little extra. And I have to say, for example, you know, Gaylord does not handle enough traffic, even now, that it, 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 could, be, it could be a three-laner and be just fine. But it's being built as a five-laner because, you know, you can't, you can't make it too small. But, you know, <laughs> here's where I stop talking. Now, one-way streets, which we're getting rid of. Oh, and I, I wanted to add about Project 180, we doubled the amount of on-street parking, which Don Rifkema will confirm. The, the Main Street Center used to say it was a long time ago, each parking space is worth $10,000 a year to a local business. So we've doubled the amount of on-street parking. And of course, we've introduced a, a bicycle system, a full bicycle network where there wasn't one before. And I know it's only half done, but it'll be great. It'll be great when it's done. We're also getting rid of all the one-ways. Now, one-ways are really bad for pedestrians because you've got all this massive traffic moving at the same in the same direction. You have multiple lanes going in the same direction, so drivers are jockeying from lane to lane because the other lane is always the faster lane, right? And, and um, it's bad for businesses because often you're driving to work past shops and driving home, home from work past houses. Well, the shops need you, they need you in the afternoon. They don't need you in the morning because you don't shop in the morning. So decisions like that can be a problem um, as well. So a lot of what we planners are doing in a lot of cities uh, like I'm doing in Cedar Rapids right now is turning triple lane one ways into triple lane two ways with a center turn lane. And because the lanes have been so oversized from the beginning, you have room for bicycle facilities as well, which is fantastic. Then the story of Vancouver, Washington, which was a main street in you know, Pacific Northwest, which spent millions of dollars every, you know, every trick in the book, the bricks, the banners, the bandstands, the bollards, the the six B's of the 80's, um, trying to make themselves more balloons, sorry, trying to make themselves more successful. And then they went in there one day and they went from going one way to going two way and it came back immediately. And the, 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 it's covered well in this article, the return of the two way street in Governing Magazine, but the heads of the Merchants Association said, just don't have one way streets in your downtown centers. I would put a little more simp a little more precisely, I think if you've got a main street that's moribund and it's one way, then it's time to consider a reversion. 
uh, and, and plenty of examples around the country like Clematis Street in West Palm Beach where that's been accomplished with great outcomes. Then there's just the width of the lanes. You know, the famous Andres Duany Street, he says you can see the curvature of the earth, uh, the way that we've been designing <laughs> streets lately. And just that the standards have changed. This is a subdivision from the 60s outside of Washington. Look at the width of the street. And here's one from the 80s. Right? They've just gotten fatter because the rules have changed, even to the point where when my old neighborhood in South Beach had to rebuild the street because it was flooding, they took half the sidewalks away. Because it was working perfectly fine before, but there was a new standard. And of course, people go faster on wider streets. Citizens are fighting back. This is Birmingham, Michigan, uh, but it's happening all over the country. And the developer, Vince Graham, who built Ion outside of Mount Pleasant, um, put it this way for his citizens. There's a philosopher who once said, broad is the road that leads to destruction, narrow is the road that leads to life. And then bikes. Bikes are the major revolution, the biggest revolution currently underway in only some American cities. And my friend Tom Brennan, who works for Nelson Nygaard in Portland, I asked him to send me some pictures of biking in Portland, and he sent me this series of slides very kindly. And I said, what was this? Was this bike to work day? And he said, no, it was Tuesday. <laughs> but you know, in Portland, in Portland, they've invested $50 million, which is a lot, but over 25 years, the cost of half of a highway cloverleaf in bicycle infrastructure. And they've, they've gone from being just like the rest of the country in terms of how many people biked to 15 times the rest of the country. They have an 80% commute mode share by biking, sorry, sorry, 8% commute, commute mode share by biking and walking. You know, it used to be that half of us walked to school or biked to school, and now it's only 15% of Americans walk or bike to school. 43% of Portlanders walk or bike to school because of these investments that have been made. New York City, again, when you build these things, people bike more. You have a lot of latent bikers waiting to come out of the woodwork, even in places like Long Beach, California. And I tell communities, you know, what sort of bike lane should I have? Do we really need all the color and et cetera? I say, look, this isn't really just a bike lane. This is a horizontal billboard where you're telling your citizens and your potential citizens, we are a young city, we are a hip city, we're a progressive city, we, we are a, a healthy city. And it's worth much more. I'm sure you spend a lot more on marketing than you do on your bike lanes. And this is better marketing. Especially if you separate the lanes, like we have in Washington, DC, um, so that they're buffered. And the buffered lanes are the ones that invite the, the women and the children who wouldn't otherwise necessarily bike. That sounds sexist, but it's, it's the statistic. Um, that to get, you know, with bicycling, it's basically safety in numbers. And to make biking safe, you need a lot of bikers. And the way to get a lot of bikers is with the separated lanes. Parallel parking, the barrier of steel that protects sidewalks from moving vehicles, often forgotten. And then, uh, oh, and, and, and of course, you know, here's an example of how important it is this is a street in Fort Lauderdale. Allowed to park on one side, not allowed to park on the other. Here's the parking side at happy hour, and here's the non-parking side at happy hour. And this business has since closed. And then the street trees that make it comfortable, and I have a whole chapter in my book on street trees because they do so much for our health, for our stormwater, uh, for our environment. Um, but they also stop us from getting hit sometimes <laughs> by cars. And they generally, the presence of a car next to a street causes a car to move more slowly, sometimes abruptly, but it's an important factor in the landscape. And then just every detail, the radius of curvature at a corner, whether it's a two-foot curve or a 40-foot curve, determines the speed of the vehicle, the comfort of the pedestrian. But really, every detail of the streetscape is saying, this is a pedestrian place or this is a vehicular place. And I love, you probably can't read it, but the caption at the bottom of this article, the photo about um, City Center in Vegas, which has been pretty, such a failure, such a, such a you know, environmental effort, lead platinum. And now they're talking about, last I heard, they were talking about actually taking built floors off of buildings because it's been such a failure. It says, some say the entrance to City Center is not inviting to pedestrians. <laughs> like, who are those people? What are they thinking? But wherever you have swoops and stripes and stream form geometrics, you are saying, you know, this is a place for cars, not for people. And of course, no one, no one engineer's prerogative can be allowed to control the, you know, in this case, the drainage. You know, the 100-year storm means that every day this woman has to climb this curb. Uh, finally, there's the signals. 
It says, obey orders, don't think. Um, I'm sorry to say this just after you've rebuilt it in Oklahoma City, but walkable cities do not have push-button street signals. You shouldn't have to ask for a light. And they don't seem to ever do anything anyway, and they're frustrating, and, um, you know, cities that are truly walkable cities, it's just the, the pedestrians concurrent with the vehicles, no right turn on red, and um, push buttons are, are not the way to go. But the other half of it, of course, which you can improve even once you've got the push buttons in, too late for that, is the signal cycles. And that walkable cities tend to have 60 second signal cycles, and unwalkable cities tend to have three minute signal cycles. And that's something you can pay some attention to. These last two categories are much quicker, so I'll, I'm almost done. Am I okay, Blair? Yeah, okay. You look a little uncomfortable there. Um, a comfortable walk has to do with the fact that all animals seek two things, well, among other things, seek two things together, prospect and refuge. We like to see our prey and our predators, but we also need to know that our backs are covered. And that's in our, in our DNA from years and years of evolution. We can't fight it, it's in our bones. And that's why on vacation we go to places like this, you know, split in Croatia with beautifully shaped, as someone mentioned earlier, outdoor living rooms that embrace us and make us feel that we will not be attacked by a lion. Uh, architects and planners have been talking about it for a long time. What's the ideal ratio of height to width? If it gets beyond six to one, width to height, we don't really feel comfortable anymore. Um, one to six is okay. Here in Salzburg, in very northern, Salzburg's north of Boston, but six to one can work wonderfully uh, if the architecture is nice. And then the alternative, of course, is Houston. And the point being that the, the, the principal thing that undermines that sense of enclosure uh, is, the, is the surface parking lot that we have all over our cities. And a wonderful, uh, I'm so glad it was mentioned earlier, uh, Chris Leimiger, I guess, was talking about Columbus, Ohio, and the short north. And the short north is pictured in the south of this, uh, to the right in this picture. Um, and the convention center neighborhood, which also has a stadium, is pictured in the background. And between them is this, this freeway, this depressed freeway. Ignore the Z-shaped building to the right. That wasn't there. That was built based on the success of what you see, which is this bridge. That when the state DOT had to rebuild the bridge, they accepted a million and a half extra dollars from the city. And instead of building a 80-foot bridge, they built a 160-foot bridge and gave it to a developer to build this. And if you were to believe the newspaper reports, um, the resurgence of the short north is not just a factor of demographic changes, as Chris describes, but it's a factor that now people walk between these neighborhoods. And the it's an outcome of the conventioneers and the people who go to sports games are now going into the short north, which was really struggling to eat dinner, to buy tchotchkes, to otherwise enjoy urbanism. And it just shows how important containment is, however you wish to provide it. But of course, containment is not enough if the containment looks like this. And that's the interesting walk. This is the street that connects the two best hotels in Grand Rapids. Grand Rapids is a pretty darn walkable downtown, but not this street. It doesn't attract many people. Because if on the left you have a structured parking deck, and if on the right you have a hotel facility apparently constructed in admiration of that parking deck, <laughs> then you don't attract many walkers. And we need to be entertained. You know, we, humans are among the social primates. Nothing interests us more than other humans, as was said. And um, Joe Riley in Charleston taught us it only, it only takes 20 feet of building to hide 200 feet of garage. This is the Chia Pet Garage in South Beach that similarly does the same thing. And, and the idea that we put surface parking lots in the middles of blocks now, not on the edges of blocks, but to have a thin layer of building of some type hiding it from the curb. Use wayfinding if necessary to get people there, but don't ask people to walk along these lots. So that's hard. It's hard in a driving culture with limited amount of money to do all these things. And that leads to the final step, which is the last chapter of the book, which is, which is called Pick Your Winners, and another DPZ, Dwani concept of urban triage, which acknowledges that you know, if this is the list, and you need a, a reason to walk, a safe walk, a comfortable walk, and an interesting walk, and all the city typically controls, at least in the short term, is the safe walk, is the design of the street. And by the way, I should say, in discussing Project 180, we're doing Project 180 in lots of other cities, but you could call it Project 2 or Project 4 because we're not paying millions. 
we're simply restriping. We're not rebuilding anything. We're just restriping lanes, fewer travel lanes, two-way systems, more parking, more biking. And that's possible, but if, if all the city really controls is number two, then the place to make the investment, if it's gonna pay off, has to have the other three things already. There has to be a reason to walk, a comfortable walk, and an interesting walk. So that leads to urban triage, and just to show you very quickly, this plan for downtown Fort Lauderdale, where you, you walk the streets and you say, where is the walk useful, comfortable, and interesting? And you grade every street. And the streets that come out all right, and you can see a few towards the south, very few do, because this is not a, this is not a walkable downtown. But the streets that are reasonably comfortable and reasonably interesting, they get the investment first. And you create a primary network of walkability and light green, a secondary network of walkability and dark green. And the rest of the gray streets, you don't include at all. Those are principally automotive streets. And that's OK, because it doesn't take a lot to create a walkable center in a community. And then you fix those streets. You put the parallel parking back. This street's wide enough to add bike lanes without changing anything, because the lanes are so darn wide. Um, and then you fix the street walls because there are missing teeth in this plan, and the red buildings are the missing teeth that complete the comfortable and interesting walk in the primary network. And the, there's only 10 of them. The blue teeth are the secondary network. I should add, sorry Blair, that there's another factor I didn't mention, which has to do with equity and has to do with anchors, that you know, the key north-south street, you can see it here with all the red buildings upon it, the key north-south street in, the, in this network is actually a really bad street right now, but it's necessary because it connects the bus station to the center of the community. So there's also, it's also important to think about who's not walking in your city and how can we serve them. I mean, sorry, not driving in your city, and how can we serve them as we make this network. So you've, you're filling in these key missing teeth. And then my last point, as I conclude, is that, and when I say downtown, I don't just mean downtown Oklahoma City. I mean the, the mixed-use commercial areas of your, of your city or cities or towns. So fixing downtown may seem unfair, particularly when so few people live downtown. And it's a question that's often asked in planning, is why are you working on the downtown? We were doing the downtown master plan, as was mentioned, for Baton Rouge, and some citizens came in from an inner ring neighborhood, a very poor neighborhood, struggling neighborhood, and they said to Andres, why are you, very publicly, loudly, why are you fixing downtown? No one lives there. We need your help in our neighborhood. To which Andres replied, you were right. We would love to work in your neighborhood. Um, but downtown, wherever you live in your city, wherever you live, downtown is the one part of the city that belongs to everybody. You have your neighborhood, and you own the downtown too. Secondarily, the, the um, image that people have in their heads, be they a recent graduate or a corporation, anyone who's considering coming to your city, the image they have is of your downtown. So if you lift that ship, if you, if you lift that tide, you know, then all the other ships will tend to rise. And the, the ultimate kind of experience we had of this was in Lodo, I should say in Denver, where in the 90s, all the planners, right, Ellen, all the planners were saying, you gotta go see Denver. And so we went to see Denver. And what they took us to wasn't Denver, it was Lodo, lower downtown. It wasn't Lodo, it was one block of Lodo that was perfect or close to it. It had Mayor, you know, the future Mayor Hickenlooper's Wincoop Brewery, it had a pool hall, it had the old Union Station empty but beautiful, it had a nicely parallel parked street, et cetera. And that one block made Lodo and that one neighborhood made Denver so that over the next 10 years their population increased by 25%. It's one of the cities everyone's moving to. It started so small. So the urban triage message and the, the fixed downtown message first, the fixed downtown first message is basically saying, don't spread the wealth so thin that your entire city is mediocre. Pick a place that can really be excellent, start there, and it will, it will snowball outward. So that's the book. Um, these are the other books if you're a real hardcore walkability fan. Uh, and I would love to have more Twitter followers, which is there. Um, and I welcome, I even welcome emails from all 700 of you. But I really thank you, I'm sorry I ran over, I thank you so much for your attention and I'm, I'm grateful to be a part of this really important day today. Thank you.